welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to this episode 65 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Uh, this week we are uh, talking to Graham Shaw who competed in the Race to Alaska or R2AK.com as the website's known. And it's a really cool story about quite a unique race uh, that goes up the west coast of the US, uh, past the Canadian coast and finishes in Alaska and it's a race that uniquely enables competitors to paddle, sail or row their way uh, to the finish line and uh, it includes uh, stand-up paddle boards, uh, kayakers, canoeists, rowers, sailboats, pretty much any type of vessel uh, that can get its way from the start line in Washington to the finish line in Alaska uh, under any means other than motor over the period of, uh, of a couple of weeks. So um, I'm going to link to um, r2ak.com from the Facebook group, uh, so go check that out. Uh, and uh, this is a really cool story uh, and a race you might consider doing if you've if you got access to West Coast America from a sailing point of view. Um, before we jump into that, uh, just a couple of, a couple of updates. Uh, I am back in the Gold Coast in Queensland uh, for Christmas and uh, heading back to Pittwater in 12 days' time to do the Pittwater to Southport race. After recently completing the uh, passage to Pittwater via Middleton and Elizabeth Reefs, Lord Howe Island and Bulls Pyramid, as uh, I talked about in the last episode of the podcast. So um, I had a couple of challenges with my Predict Win Tracker. And I mentioned two episodes ago you could track our progress uh, via the Predict Win Tracker. I had a couple of technical issues, uh, but I have to say I've been very impressed with the technical support at Predict Wind, uh, who have updated the live tracking which you can access via the homepage at oceansailingpodcast.com and uh, I dealt with uh, Karen McMaster there who replied to several emails over the space of three days including a Saturday and I was quite blown away when she casually dropped in she was leaving shortly to head to Sydney for the Rolex Sydney Hobart race and she's competing on Wild Oats 10 uh, an all-girl team so uh, I encourage you to follow Karen and her team in the, this year's Sydney Hobart race and uh, I'm hoping to do an interview with the team from Predict Wind in future but I guess it's a great example and a rare example of uh, technical support um, uh, from a company that's providing weather routing information to sailors all over the world and uh, when you're dealing with a customer support team they have people on their team that are actually competing in the Rolex Sydney Hobart race so how's that for uh, capable people in customer support. Finally before we jump into this week's episode I've got the opportunity uh, in the near future to interview Glenn Ashby from Emirates Team New Zealand, uh, a 10 times world A-class uh, catamaran champ, as well as a winning skipper from the recent America's Cup. And so I'd encourage you to go to the Ocean Sailing Podcast Facebook group, and uh, in there I've, I've posted and asked for questions that I can ask Glenn. So if you've got any questions at all you want me to ask Glenn, uh, go to the Facebook group put them into the post, and I'll make sure I capture all those questions and ask Glenn when I catch up with him in the new year. So uh, enjoy this week's episode with Graham Shaw uh, and his story of the race to Alaska. Mm. Hello. Hey, Graham, how are you doing? Good, and you must be David. I'm David, yeah, yeah, good to meet you. Is this, is this still a good time for you? Yeah, no, it's fine. I'm sitting in the kitchen here, got a cup of tea. That's great. I'm uh, sitting uh, downstairs in the back office at my daughter's cafe. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, yeah, hence the industrial look behind me. Oh, I guess uh, I can put my camera on for a minute. I don't know if it's good to keep it on all the time, but I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, then say it's pretty clear so far, so that's good. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so what's and what's the what's the weather and temperature like where you are right now? Uh, it's actually um, it's been glorious fall weather, like clear blue skies, but uh, it's going to drop to freezing tonight. So uh, it's probably around three now. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, temperature wise. Yeah. yeah, and you're in Sydney, Melbourne. Uh, I'm in the Gold Coast, so uh, oh, Gold Coast. so the the temperatures plummeted to about. Uh, uh, I think 26 <laughs> degrees Celsius today, um, so it's a, cool, so it's a yeah. cool, cooler day. Yeah, it's um, that time of year, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, that's right, that's right, it's just starting to heat up while it's just under, oh, it's cooling down for you. So um, so uh, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, have a uh, interview on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. The, like, this is a fascinating topic for me, and I, I only just heard about the R2AK 
race maybe a few months ago now. I, I, I must have heard about it somewhere on a podcast, maybe, or somebody mentioned it. So um, yeah, when Stuart mentioned you and the opportunity to talk to you, I, I, I jumped at the chance. Um, well, hopefully we don't disappoint you. But <laughs> it was a very interesting experience for sure. An interesting bunch of folks. Mm-hmm. So, and I guess uh, they'd be interested if you do something. They'd probably be interested to know about it too. I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, so, what's the? I mean, what's the background for you uh, with this race? Like, how did how did this all come about? And um, um, well, I'll give you a bit of a rundown. I guess the um, the race itself, you may know a bit about, but the idea of the race was, um, I guess, to attract. A different crowd from the usual sailing racing fraternity mm-hmm. by making it a rule that you couldn't have a motor on your boat and I guess the idea was that that would disqualify a lot of cruising boats and racing boats and uh, maybe make the fleet more diverse and interesting mm-hmm. and I guess as a kid I grew up on this coast you know rowing and paddling and kayaking around so the idea of doing it was fairly appealing but um, I guess you kind of race with the boat you got and we had a boat that I thought we could use that one and be a lot more comfy. So, uh, we actually took a catamaran that we've sailed around a fair bit on okay. and, uh, and just went in it with that. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, when did you complete it? When, when was that? The race was just this summer gone, 2018. Okay. Um, it's been running for four years. It's mm-hmm. a relatively new thing and it seems to be growing in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the first, year they had a smaller group and then a larger group and i think there were about 38 boats in it Mm -hmm. to start this year and Mm -hmm. of course they don't all finish um Mm -hmm. but uh yeah the yeah it's an adventure race um without a lot of emphasis on winning for most people anyway Mm -hmm. well i read read online on their website that uh first place is ten thousand dollars second place is a set of steak knives and third place is nothing at all so that's you know, right. It's quite, and, um, it's quite hilarious. <laughs> but it is. It's a. It's a really, really amazing race course because it uh, it combines sort of the wildness of an ocean trip um, in as much as you've got no support further north, mm-hmm. but you're in close quarters with dangerous country and strong currents. So you're traveling in between rocks and things with, uh, you know, curious weather and, uh, you know, I guess if you're trying hard you're going day and night through that and uh, mm-hmm. and and with the currents in this coast it makes it pretty interesting and the the weather's um, notoriously fickle you know it's sort of a lot of calms with a few strong blows is typical right yeah and not a lot of lovely uh, not the sort of thing you get down near queensland with the trade winds blowing every day in the afternoon mm-hmm. um and it's fast it's a fascinating race because you can essentially sail or row or paddle so quite some quite uh yeah. Interesting propulsion techniques. Um, well, it goes beyond that into a variety of homemade pedal drives. Right. <laughs> inspired, yeah. inspired by the America's Cup, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, I guess, although those guys were trying to pump up their hydraulics, this is actually driving propellers typically. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, okay. And what, and what, I mean, how, just tell me about the dimensions of your catamaran. It's a 34-foot cat, and mm-hmm. it's uh, it's an ocean-going boat. It's from Australia. It's sailed a bunch of oceans, mm-hmm. um, and it's got it's kind of done plenty of that sort of stuff, but it's usually had an outboard motor as an option. Mm-hmm. Um, so this time we put a sliding seat rowing station on one of the hull transoms and a pedal drive, homemade pedal drive on the other one. Uh-huh. Um, we could drive it with two people if we wanted to, and we could reach an astounding speed of almost two knots in flat calm. <laughs> And for what duration before you got tired? Oh, we'd last at least 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we keep going, but um, slower and slower. Like probably we couldn't sustain two knots, but we probably could sustain 1.8. Mm-hmm. And we did that because we had days of calm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we weren't um, as competitive as some who were more athletic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we're an older bunch. You can see from me um, that... Uh, we're not uh, fighting fit about to join the Olympics, but we were in it and we did our best. And so, yeah, we could keep going for a fair bit. And it was mostly, I thought, a way of getting out of um, bad current and maybe into a anchorage or out of a wind hole. But it turned out to be an important part of the race. And mm-hmm. so some of the winning boats probably estimated that they were, you know, human powered 14 hours a day. 
Wow, um, that's a big percentage, yeah. and and like yeah. and, and it's a seven hundred and fifty nautical mile race in terms of both sure. legs. So how long did it take you to complete the race? We took seven days, pretty much neat. Well, wow. and uh, that's pretty good going given the adversity. We were your all hours behind the winners, so wow. Yeah, well, congratulations. That's, a, that's an excellent result. <laughs> oh, we were happy. We were in amongst it. But yeah, the, the people who were more athletic and more driven, um, you know, did do better. I have to say that it changed my experience, that part, because myself and the crew went in it with the intention of having an adventure and heading north and going with a bunch of people who were willing to take on something like that. Mm -hmm. But after the first day, we actually realized we probably had the speed to compete, which was a bit frustrating because we weren't mentally prepared for that at all. <laughs> and you hadn't... You hadn't been going to the gym for some months before that to build up to it, do you think, by any chance? Yeah, we were right in amongst the leaders after two days, and we were thinking, oh dear, this is a bit of a worry. <laughs> so is it fair to say that you probably exceeded your expectations in terms of where you finished relative to the, the leading bunch? Yeah, I'd say we did. Yeah, we did better than we thought. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I mean, we can always um, analyze that. I think that different years... There's been some boats that are ridiculously fast, and this year there weren't any of those. <laughs> right, okay. So that really made it a, a true um, le a level of playing field, should we say, um, given some of the crazy stuff that's about yeah, well, technology maybe, now. Maybe the, the, the hurdles weren't quite so high this year, maybe, in some ways, mm -hmm. for, uh, for us anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was mostly about having fun, and we had a mixed crew. My partner, who sailed on the boat a fair bit, and... Uh, a friend here who had hardly sailed at all, but who was willing to pedal, mm -hmm. and um, a friend from Australia who has raced on, you know, monohulls on sort of around the bay and stuff like that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we had a mixed crew. So there was that three or four in total that you had. Four of us. Four of you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and what percentage of the time would you have been, uh, you know, rowing or paddling? Um, do you do, do you kind of guesstimate? Yeah, personally, not that much because it turned out that it was better for me to trim sails and steer the boat. Mm -hmm. um, the conditions are so remarkably changeable mm -hmm. that even in the quiet, um, just getting down the back and pedaling, we'd end up backwinded in no time. Or um, ah, so, so, right, and then you drop and sails, so you, and then then the wind comes and your sails aren't up, up, ready to go. Yeah. Or, yeah, right, of course. It was, it was actually, you needed somebody trimming it even when you were going two knots just mm -hmm. to stop putting brakes on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I ended up doing a lot of that. We probably, uh, everyone had a go at the rowing and the paddling um, and the pedaling. But uh, David, he was the star peddler without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Michelle and Jenny did their bit. And I rowed a fair bit, um, especially when the push was on. David and I would jump on together. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that would only last for a couple of hours at a time. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, that's pretty tedious, especially, I mean, what how, what sort of weight is your vessel? Um, it's a very good question, and I have never weighed it, even mm -hmm. though I've had it for years. My guess is that it's around um, between four and a half and five and a half thousand pounds. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I guess once you get moving, you've got momentum, but you've got you've got a bit of windage, yeah. windage as well. Um, yeah, well... It, it's a lot more to move. The boats that were going, like the boats that were more easily driven were smaller, and the monohulls, the small little monohulls were easily driven yeah. too, just this on wetted surface. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, yeah. Okay, so just, so we, tell me, where does it start and where does it finish, and how do you explain that initial 40-mile leg and then, and then the second 710-mile leg? Yeah. How, how does that all work? The 40-mile leg is, they call it the proven ground. It's really... Um, I think it's part of their risk management mm -hmm. that uh, it, it crosses the Juan de Fuca Strait. I don't expect you know it, but that's a, a gap between Vancouver Island and Washington Coast. And the wind funnels in through there mm -hmm. fairly well. Mm -hmm. So quite often it does, you know, send up a bit of a chop and a blow. So um, anybody that couldn't cross that probably shouldn't be heading off into unsupervised territory in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably their thinking. So. They give you, I think they give you either 24 or 48 hours. I can't remember which because it's kind of irrelevant. It only takes about four or five if it's a good day. Yeah. Um, and so you just do that bit. And it's kind of to get to know who the other racers are, I guess, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it's just a test for them and another excuse to set up another party before the real race starts. Mm -hmm. It's not included in the time. Mm -hmm. So race officially starts from 
Victoria, which is the bottom of Vancouver Island. Right. And that actually kicks off, you know, a couple of days after the first. So quite often people break themselves on the first crossing as well and have to fix a bunch of stuff. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these boats are cobbled together uh, kind of at the last minute in people's garages. It's, it's quite right. a little... So it's probably not Sydney Hobart safety standards in terms of the compliance then. Well, they actually do um, something like it. It's, it's absolutely not Sydney Hobart standard, but um, they do go through um, inspecting of every boat and they right. make sure everyone has safety equipment and okay. you know, good communication and backups for a bunch of things. So as far as I know, nobody has um, come to grief. Uh, well, some people take physical risks, I think, over time, just exposing themselves to the elements and stuff, because mm. in the smaller craft, I think that can be really bad. Mm -hmm. But they've all got dry suits and radios and EPIRBs and spot trackers and all that kind of stuff with them. Okay. Uh, but quite often what happens is the first day they break something that wasn't set up right, and usually the drive system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so and then with that initial first leg, do you, do you have many that then don't continue on, or is, is there a pretty high yeah. success rate? Um, typically, people are pretty keen because you've invested a lot in getting to the starting line. This year, I believe there was only one um, intending racer who didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. They also have a bunch of people who can go in the first part just as a kind of entertaining leg. Mm -hmm. So, right. quite a local craft that went in that as contestants of sorts but they weren't actually in the bigger race uh -huh. and so uh, they they went along but yeah there was one guy that um didn't get there in time yeah yeah oh, okay just too slow in terms of the cutoff time for that, that first league yeah okay yeah um and so what, what's the kind of like backstory to how you came to enter the race like where did that where did how did that come about uh, I guess the, as soon as I saw it, I thought that looks like fun. I'd be in that. Um, and I guess I just had to try and convince a few people to join in. That was pretty much all there was to it. Mm -hmm. it it's, a, it's a story, I guess, the way that they set it up. And um, I, it appeals to a whole bunch of things for mm -hmm. me. It's, uh, I guess I've gone in racing, in club racing and ocean racing in bigger boats. And, and it's fun, but it's not... Um, I can't afford to do it like personally. Mm -hmm. So I'm always sort of just pulling on a string or poking or doing one or two jobs and uh, to sort of have the big picture of this and really to take it on as a, as a kind of a real adventure mm. uh, appeals to me immensely. Yeah. Well, and it's a fascinating part of the world to see as well. Like, you know, in terms oh, of yeah. like, the coastline and the scenery, it's just so far removed from what we see in Australia. And the wildlife, you know, mm. it's just, uh, just stunning the stuff that you do see as it turns out. So, and what's yeah. what, what are some of the memorable sites for you um, that you saw, um, that, you know, on your trip in terms of the landscape and the scenery and the wildlife? Well, um, <clears throat> I guess to start with the, it's like fjord country, a lot of it up mm -hmm. through there, because mm -hmm. you go, you're required to pass by two checkpoints. Mm -hmm. Both of them lead you inside islands, so you're going through these narrow um, passes with very high mountains all around. So quite often in the you know early morning light and the late morning, you've got these amazing um, vistas up these long channels with interesting shadows and light and colors, mm -hmm. and very large mountains. So it can be stunning, just you know gobsmacking, stunning, just even looking out and seeing things. So that's really neat. Um, some of the whirlpools and rapids and things like that are pretty amazing to see. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's just a lot of a lot of sea life. There's apparently they make a big deal of there being bears on the country. We didn't see a bear. Uh, we were more at, <laughs> at sea, but we saw a lot of whales, a lot of dolphins, a lot of different kinds of whales and sea lions and seals and otters and you know a lot of that stuff. I'm just gonna. Turn this off because uh, sure. there we go. Yeah, yeah. So we did see a lot of um, a lot of that, and more on the way back even because, of course, we could take our time and travel mm -hmm. slow, mm -hmm. open our eyes more. And what's what are some of the the sort of weather extremes that you saw, and the and the and the currents and tides you know, mm -hmm. that you saw? Because that's kind of for some people yeah. that haven't sailed in those kind of conditions, it could be kind of hard to comprehend some of the some of the head yeah. tides or currents that you get? Well, um, basically the um, one extreme, of course, was zero wind. 
<laughs> so we had quite a bit of that, um, and so just nothing. And then, of course, the tides in that early stage would run anything from zero up to about four knots through wow. those passes. So we could um, go against most of it, but not all of it. So we did get stuck the very first day mm -hmm. trying to break between two islands. We, we didn't get through in time, and so we ended up having to anchor till mm -hmm. the tide changed. Mm -hmm. And then um, later on, when we came up, there's a place, if you do get a chance to have a look, the strongest current is called Seymour Narrows, which runs at up to 15 knots. Wow. Um, and so it's basically, it's totally no go if it's against you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we arrived just on the end of the ebb, which would have taken us through, but mm -hmm. then we would have 100 miles of current against us at two or three knots. So we actually decided to use that time to sleep for a whole tide. Mm -hmm. um, and with the beginning of the flood or the, with the ebb to take us through the next on the next ebb. Mm -hmm. So um, that was, you know, who knows if it was a good racing decision. It certainly was a good one to get some rest and to enjoy the trip. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so we end up waiting um, fully eight hours by the time the ebb died and then we got going and then let the whole t tide run through and then we went again. So um, that was a big a big, big slow, um, you know, 10 o'clock at night, which was just on dusk. So then we carried on through the night into mm -hmm. the narrow channel. Um, and that was great because we were racing boat with, with another boat that had also done the same thing. Um, and that's the cool thing about this race is it doesn't really matter where you are. There's always someone near you mm -hmm. and that's what you race with. So we had a, it was actually a J88, some young kids, some young dinghy sailors that were hot. And uh, so we were crossing tacks with them all night long up this passage, which was really fun. Uh, we probably sailed within a mile of them for about 45 hours. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. So lots, <laughs> lots, of, lots of races within the race, but that, that's pretty cool yeah, having absolutely. boats around you. It's always more yeah. enjoyable, I think, on big ocean races than if you just don't see anybody sort of within a few hours of the start until, until the end. And another thing with those guys is we the um, there's roughly a hundred miles of passage up through until you break out of the north of Vancouver Island, mm -hmm. and just before we got out, there was an option to go through a narrow pass into um, more open water, mm -hmm. which we thought we could do, and we tried and we failed. Mm -hmm. So we were driven back by current yet again um, after you know three or four hours of just slogging our guts out trying to get around some points and hauling ourselves up on anchors and doing everything we could imagine until we finally got exhausted and dragged back and sent back a number of kilometers where we anchored again and waited for the tide. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, um, and the other boats were doing similar things. So, you know, and of course the ones that are behind are busy catching up through that time. So it's, it's really fascinating course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lo lots of, uh, lots of tactics and lots of decisions and lots of interesting combinations yeah. by the sound of it. And maybe the other thing that I should tell you about is that part of our crew selection was that we were um, kind of interested in eating well. Mm -hmm. So we probably had the most luxurious boat in the race, as mm -hmm. in comfortable and big and um, warm and dry. Yeah. And so we also had very good food and drink. And so uh, we were sitting down to rather nice meals and uh, enjoying ourselves all together more than we probably were expected to. <laughs> Well, I think they're so important. Um, I, I know with some of the stuff I've done that, you know, if the food, yeah. if the food's a high point of the trip, it puts the icing on the cake. But if it's a low point, you know, if you're having a yeah. bad day and you're cold and wet and things aren't going your way, then the food's not great. It's, you know, your, people still, your crew especially start to question why they're even there. So that's that's really good to hear. Yeah, no, they were good that way. And and they also, the the racing people, I don't know if you've had a chance to look, but they do quite a bit of good media. They send boats out. We joked and called them the whale watching boat because it felt like you were the whales and they were coming to poke at you. Oh, right. And they, so they come out with a media crew and taking photos of you as you're sailing along and doing interviews and mm -hmm. chatting. Um, and so we had that experience quite a bit. And uh, one of our people, Michelle, she kind of likes that stuff. So she hammed it up with them and they had a, they had a pretty good time with that. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of joking around with the with the media boats and the the just general camaraderie as it was going on. Not all the time, not when it was dark, not when it was foggy, but uh, <laughs> they seemed to find us in good times. And that's quite amazing, actually. It's quite unique to have a, such a kind of diverse and, and wild um, part of the world to be starting, but have that contact, not only with your competitors, but also with the media yeah. base. 
stopping it to check on you and to, to say hello. That's yep, really yep, quite, time, quite interactive. Yeah, they, they, um, there was basically there were three points where they chartered a boat. Mm -hmm. And so they just met everybody as they came through. Mm -hmm. And so there was after um, there's a place called Bella Bella before the Hecate Strait. That was the last time we saw people. And from then on, you really were on your own. Mm -hmm. And and it became a little more wild and mm -hmm. other is more open as well. You're out into the open ocean at that point, too. So the waves get bigger and different different game. Yeah, right, and that's where some of the bigger boats come into their own too, I guess. Um, that's back true. In the sea yeah. State. Um, yeah, yeah, and just generally having the legs to go a little quicker. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so, how did I mean? Was there a part of the, the the course that you enjoyed the most, or enjoyed the least, or did you just find it all the variety just fascinating all the way through? Personally, the hardest thing for me was not sleeping enough mm -hmm. because the conditions were just so changeable mm -hmm. that. Uh, and myself, I guess, being the person who took it on himself to kind of make a lot of the decisions, even down to sail changes and, you know, direction, I would get called up as soon as I fell asleep, pretty much. And mm -hmm. that was fine with me, except for the fact that I didn't cope very well after a while. Yeah, so that was the hardest part. But we um, during some of those times when I was trying to sleep in the in the quiet, calm we had some adventures getting tangled up in nets and um, big balls of kelp and oh right, things like that. So we uh, we had some downtime for the the crew were uh, a little discouraged from time to time, trying to make the boat go in no wind and terribly awkward conditions. Um, but mostly it was it was really lovely. Mm -hmm. You know the whole was really lovely. We were never cold or miserable or um, and we had you know we sort of had twenty five knots on the on the nose. Um, which is lovely, mm. um, but sometimes a bit choppy with the currents against it. So it'd mm -hmm. stand up. A bit. And then at the end, we probably had, you know, high 20s from behind. And again, with awkward, short, square sea. So we'd have, you know, 10 foot waves that were only 40 feet apart. Oh, right. So that's quite, it's quite, quite so it was, short, it was pretty steep and choppy. Um, yeah, it was, Steep, and you'd go racing down these things and spearing into the ones in front and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, nothing, um, nothing scary for the boat, and just awkward and a little bit uncomfortable maybe. But we were happy at that point because, of course, we were going faster than other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always found that um, it's it's almost more stressful and demoralizing in, in little or no wind, particularly if you've got adverse current, than if you've got plenty of wind and everybody's just focused on keeping the boat moving and staying comfortable and. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's so much tougher, um, particularly with all the things you do to constantly trim sails and try and keep the boat moving. It's just so much tougher psychologically, I think, too. It is um, hard, that's for sure. But I, I would say we didn't really have a morale issue on our boat. Everyone was right into it. Mm -hmm. um, we just had a, a, a ton of fun. Um, the only down part was just being just shagged. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and getting in at the end and just going to bed for like 14 hours. <laughs> And so for you, Graham, as you as you got a bit sort of tighter as the days rolled on, did you do you do you find that um, sleep kind of deprivation sort of did that start to make you grumpy or affect your judgment or did it cause you to put off doing things that you wanted to do but couldn't be bothered? I mean, how do you if you look back at it? So I was always always I'm always yeah. interested to see how to fix other people because I, I know how to fix me and I always seen I always yeah. see this wisdom in hindsight, but at the time I don't always see it. Um, you know, and I guess you probably watched the uh, the route to room, hey? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's so crazy. sleep deprivation can be a bummer. Crazy stuff. But, um, no, I guess you'd have to ask the crew about how grumpy I got. I think uh, I think they were they'd be kind to me. I think they would, and uh, and they were so good that I don't think I could really be very grumpy with anybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely, it was a it was hard, and I think that probably the seeing as you're kind of looking at that stuff, the personal challenge for me was more early on in the race when I realized that we actually could probably get in amongst it, but that we had to kind of decide not to. <laughs> yeah, right. Because we really wanted to, yeah. but I just, we didn't have the team to do it and we weren't prepared to do it. And so that was a little bit of a thing. And so I actually had a little moment when I, uh, I told everybody that I'd, uh, had, had, I'd been dealing with um, really wanting them to do a whole bunch of stuff that they couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> the internal internal tug of war. Yeah, that between... sort of thing. Can't we just paddle for six hours straight? 
<laughs> no. So uh, yeah, I kind of had to come to terms with that. But that was pretty early on. So I think uh, I think we got that. And then we had we did have some scary times, and we did have um, we we came much too close to a rock at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably are familiar with you know the um, screen GPS type um, chart plotter navigation now, which yeah means very rarely have a paper chart up on deck mm. and. Well, um, if you're not scaled at the right zone, you can actually miss stuff. Yeah, and so, easily too. Um, uh, we came way too close to a rock, and that was a good shakeup. Mm -hmm. And another um, little adventure that we had is we had. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me telling you this, but David brought a drone along. Oh, um, with, cool. with a view to taking some gorgeous photos of us sailing along. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, the drone and David hadn't quite worked out how to land on a moving boat very effectively. So the drone ended up swimming. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> oh, I've, I've, I've recently acquired a drone and by, nowhere have I read yet how you land on a moving object. I, I understand the concept of returning to where it left from, but the trouble is the boat's not where it left from yeah. anymore. I know, so. it loves that idea. But yeah, David, he's pretty good at that tech stuff, but um, they're also smart enough to not want to run into rigging wires and things like that. Okay. So it would come close, but it wouldn't come on board. Oh, and then the in the meantime, the battery's ticking down. Tick, tick, exactly. tick, tick, tick. Exactly. Right. That's interesting. Anyway. I'm losing you there. That's right. You've just come back. It's been quiet. But um, I was going to say, that's interesting. So you really need to test the landing and takeoff part before the boat's actually moving anywhere. Um, so got well, and I guess I guess it's tricky to do, but yeah, that that would be a, a definitely a, a learning from our experience. Yeah, the drones don't seem to be designed to photo swim very well. Uh, some of them are. They're, they're some oh, is that expensive. Right? Okay. But yeah, but we didn't have one of those. But yeah, okay. so that, I guess when you're talking about sort of high points and low points, those would be some. And I guess the high points would quite often be when we. Um, thought we were doing worse and all of a sudden we'd see some boat that we expected to have disappeared and there he was. <laughs> we, we came around an island one time and obviously we'd gone different ways from yeah. these other people mm -hmm. and the crew had, uh, had a big talk about we think we're going to um, stop at this little village because you can, you can stop, there's no rules against it, it's just your time. And they said, we're gonna, we've are gonna. we had a really good time. We're not going to win anyway. Let's stop and have pizza and a beer at the next little village up the coast. <laughs> so I said, fair enough. I don't mind. And, and as we came around the corner to the village, the other boat came around the corner at the same time. And everybody totally forgot about that and was trying to <laughs> racing again. Game on. Isn't it, yeah. a, isn't it interesting, the human psychology, um, you know, whenever you hear um, people talk about, you know, social sailing or social racing, um, as soon as there's another boat, you know, it's always a race, no matter where you're going to or from. That's right. It's amazing That's psychology, right. um, and how that lifts you as well when you're suddenly mm. not on your own, because um, it's easy to assume that you're doing much worse than other people. Well, it's easy to assume when things don't go your way that other people don't have things that don't go their way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so in terms of weather forecasting and weather weather planning and routing throughout the trip, mm -hmm. what, what did you what did you use, or how did you go about that? Well, as it turns out, um, we were, we had more than we needed. Um, but the, there's VHF coverage for most of the race. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually get the standard Environment Canada forecasts most of the time. Um, and so we were able to do that. Um, the biggest challenge was planning the tides because the, the tidal currents are so, um, there's just so many channels. You've got a few marker points here and there where you can get um, current tables. Mm -hmm. But you're always extrapolating to try and guess what it's going to be like at a certain point. And I was wrong a number of times. Um, so that's that's a piece that and you can't really plan ahead because you don't know, you know, if you're going to be there two days, one day. So basically you get everywhere as fast as you can and deal with what's there is the kind of the strategy you end up with. Mm -hmm. But you sort of try and figure out, especially when there's options about going different ways, whether one might be better than the other. And that's that's a big challenge, but uh, I mean the information's all there. It's just because you're working in real time and things are changing that it can be really bad. And yeah, so, yeah, well, especially if you're aiming to just get somewhere to make the turn, and, and then you yeah. find you're two or three hours behind, and that changes everything, okay. right? Just yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, well, we had that twice. We got totally smashed by an entire tide, so you just have to suck it up. <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, you couldn't plan to get there any quicker because you're going as fast as you can. So mm -hmm. that's that's just the way that goes. I should tell you a little bit about some of the other boats in the race, perhaps. I don't that would know be great. I was going to ask you if you have any interesting yeah. stories or, or comments or to add. Well, I, mean, I think we were... We were very happy with our boat, but we were probably one of the least interesting in lots of ways because uh, there was, okay, I'll just start at one end, like there was a guy that did it in a kayak mm -hmm. uh, on his own, so wow. he was paddling the whole way. There was a guy on a stand-up paddleboard that made it some of the way, um, and, you know, so these guys were really doing a, a personal deep digging type of adventure, which yeah, was totally yeah. different from what we were doing, um, and then there was the team that won, which was the you know, they're a story in their own right. I don't know if you've followed that yet, but they were a team of young women. Mm -hmm. um, they called themselves Sail Like a Girl, and there were seven girls, and they got this team together, and they bought a, you probably know boats, so the Melgis 32, which is oh, yeah. a pretty, slip, pretty slippery boat. Yeah. Um, and they got on board that, but they didn't have tons of sailing experience, so they were training and working up for it, and mm -hmm. they had a bit of money behind them. They got a bunch of sponsorships, so they had really good, propulsion systems but a great team spirit mm -hmm. and uh, they were they were really great in, in amongst it and um, so the, yeah they were a good story and then there was a guy who wanted to do the whole thing under pedal power so he'd built a little mini trimaran with um, no sails no oars just pedals wow that's an interesting so, yeah, choice to opt out of sails that you could normally put on a sailing boat yeah and then um, Probably one of the most remarkable boats in the race was a catamaran that most people don't know um, by Mead and Jean Goujon. Um, it's uh, called the Goujon 32, mm -hmm. and it's it looks silly. It's eight feet wide, 32 feet long, and the hulls are um, maybe about 16 inches wide each, max. The whole right. thing weighs... A thousand pounds, you know, a thousand kilos, so I should say. It's almost like a stretched Hobiecat or a stretched A class cat or something. Um, yeah, but 32 feet long. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a length to width. It just sounds odd. Yeah. Um, and it's got um, self bailing water ballast. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a port tack, for example, you can fill up as many kilos as you want to carry in the starboard hull and mm -hmm. drive the thing as hard as you want. And so oh. he was super fast. Wow. But he was on his own, so he um, ended up, he couldn't keep up the pace, but he was actually leading the entire pack for half the race. Right. That's so that's a story all by itself. Yeah, it was a shame you didn't have to cover one or two other people on, on, on board, but the waterline length like that, if you just keep that machine going 24-7. Yeah, I know. Well, that's a, that, I mean, other people have had that idea. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason, he's decided not to do that. He's done it twice as a single-handed guy, and he's mm -hmm. got the record for single-handed. Oh, okay. So he's previously but, completed uh, it. Um, yeah, so twice. Like, and okay. oh, very, very um, switched on, very experienced sailor. Mm -hmm. I actually met him um, when he was on a round the world proa trip in Australia, mm -hmm. um, sailing there, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, he's been around. Okay. Um, and yeah. so you're. People, sorry. So, I mean, so a, lot of the, a lot of the sailors had done a lot of ocean sailing as well. Mm hmm. And what and what what had you done prior to this, uh, Graham, coming into this event? Um, I guess it all depends compared to what, but a fair bit. I guess I've been sailing in oceans. I first went to Australia in a trimaran from Canada, seventy eight, nineteen seventy eight, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, quite a lot of Australian sailing and South Pacific sailing, and a couple of trips to Japan and then um, New Zealand, and then this same boat we sailed in 2009 up through uh, Indonesia and Philippines and across from Japan across to Canada. Uh -huh. well, um, I don't know, compared to some people it's lots and compared to others it's not much at all. Well, that's some pretty good ocean going stuff though through some quite diverse locations and weather systems and um, so that's um, yeah, the, plenty of sea miles. Yeah, it's certainly a big one uh -huh. um, and, and I did a bit of single handing um, down, you know, around Vanuatu and Solomons and stuff like that mm -hmm. in years earlier. So kind of was used to what that meant. But, um, yeah, the boat and various boats, it, you know, it, I've never had the fastest boat, but I've always had, I like boats that sail well. So mm -hmm. that's that's part of the fun of it all. Yeah, I like yeah. boats that you can sail well, but um, be comfortable, warm and dry, well fed. Um. Yeah, that's a good a good combination. Like not just out and out 
you know, um, empty shells with no comforts inside, and you know, yeah, um, that's that's probably be, that's probably beyond what I'd be uh, looking looking to do. Um, that's for sure. It's nice to have fun, be competitive, been able to do your best, uh, push the boat to its potential, whatever that is. But yeah. but be comfortable right. and fun along the way with the people that you you're doing it with, because um, no, a ton of fun for sure. That's right. Yeah, and that would be in stark contrast with the um, there was a 32 foot beach cat that won in 2016 mm -hmm. and three guys in dry suits went full time for I think they did it in less than four days or around four days um, at silly speeds and basically lashed themselves to the deck when they wanted to run flying <laughs> <laughs> over them. Yeah, that would be a completely different experience and um, yeah. even, even four days even even 96 hours is a long time if you're not in the most comfortable conditions or um, I'll say yeah, yeah. Um, okay. For sure. So, yeah, I'm not sure what what I should else tell you, but that's certainly a bunch of stuff. What What else? I mean, so so where about just to where else is the finish line? But for the race, the finish line is in Ketchikan in Alaska, mm -hmm. and that was another exciting time for us because um, there was there, we're a multi hull a catamaran, and there were a number of trimarans who you may know uh, Ian Farrier or you may know of Farrier designs you may not I know I've uh, heard of the name of the Farrier anyway, your design now yeah. he would probably be the premium sort of simple backyard type race he's just died last year but he's got his boats are everywhere and they usually thrash us on the windward leg and so we were pretty happy, given this was a windward race, that mm -hmm. um, there were a number of farriers in it. And that was actually my goal from the beginning was to beat a farrier. Um, <laughs> but we ended up beating all of them. Wow. Um, except one. And wow. the one that just beat us by three minutes. And we had a racing drag race up the finish line with um, paddles and oars and pedals. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's every, pretty exciting. Everything at it. It was everything at yeah. it. Three minutes short. Yeah, they were they were actually faster than us under human power, so they got away. But uh, yeah, we actually snuck right up on them, and <laughs> so that was exciting too, right to the end. Mm -hmm. And what's yeah. the reception like when you get there, and what what do you then do oh. once you arrive? It's astonishing. the The people that have set it up have built a good connection with the local town, and the town of Ketchikan is actually a it's a major cruise ship port, so it's got a Kind of that kitschy tourist feel at one level but there's mm -hmm. people who actually live there and they were just amazingly wonderful so as we arrived there were people greeting us on the dock celebrating they give you beer i mean that's part of the deal you ring a bell um you're celebrated there's yacht club food everything's put on they take you out you get it's really astonishing it's uh, you get really celebrated mm -hmm. uh, which was really fun and uh in a, and then all of the people who finished, you know, to a certain level at least, hung around and welcomed the others in. So, um, like, we stayed there for an extra whole week welcoming people in, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, because people keep coming in for another more than three weeks. Yeah. Um, but uh, we stayed for a couple of weeks, one week plus our trip, so um, we could welcome a lot of people in. And it's a party every time someone comes in. And, and because it's so staggered, that's kind of remarkable because, uh, you know, it's people would be, no one arrived to an empty dock. In the middle of the night, there was locals cheering. Um, as we arrived, there was, um, there's a breakwater on the entrance. There, it was crowded, like hundreds of people yelling, a guy playing bagpipes. There was people wow. cheering calling our name. It was, you know, just ridiculous and, and tons of fun. A real festival type atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. And so how, yeah. I mean, yeah. how did you feel to sail into that given your this is seven long days, you're pretty, pretty tired. I mean, how do you, how do you feel to sail oh, into yeah. sort of reception like that? You, you always manage. I mean, even Alex Thompson, uh, he manages to rise to the occasion when you come into port and everybody's talking to you. It's a, uh, yeah, you just, you, it's just a lot of fun. And of course, we arrived at the same time with, with our competitors. So we had to share stories and drink beer with them as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that was, that was just really great. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing, I mean, you might not be surprised, but uh, there's people come from all over the world. And um, we made quite a good, few good friends, you know, people that we will 
continue to stay in touch with. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Even people that, you know, you would think that you're largely on your own boat, but because of the way they set it up, mm. you they spend time with other people and sharing stories and all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's a really cool event. It looks like a real racing rally, an adventure type event. You know, it's, it's, it's got a combination that's quite different to most other events um, for what you're describing. Yeah, and totally different. Like we were in, we've been on things like the Ambon Rally and um, Darwin Ambon races and mm -hmm. things like that, which are kind of cruiser races, but those are entirely different. You know, this is way more out there, seat of the pants type of stuff. Yeah, um, especially the conditions that you can face with the, with yeah. the weather up there and, I mean, the, and the isolation. Yeah, the difference in a lot of those cruising rallies is that the boats are very well-founded boats and often they're just pottering along and sharing company, which mm -hmm. is great fun. Mm -hmm. But these guys, a lot of these people were telling stories of life-changing experiences and, um, you know, really, yeah, they some of them had put so much into even getting to it. You know, wow. built their little boats especially for it, trained. There was a guy that had managed to lose you know like 100 pounds and get super fit as part of his prep and you know like just stuff like that mm -hmm. that uh, is not the sort of standard rally fare <laughs> no not at all um, far from it um yeah. so how long did you stay up there before heading home uh we were there about a week and then we took our time as much as we could coming back we went out via there's some islands off the coast up there called Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to visit that. And, and for us, of course, that was part of our rationale is to have a launching pad to a cruise home. And uh, it was ideal for that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did all of the crew cruise home again or did some? No, well, they had otherwise? to leave at different times. So we had them with us for a bit. And then we lost David first and then we lost Jenny and then Michelle and I came home. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah. and then how long did the return trip take you? Um, we didn't have as much time as we wanted, but I guess we probably three weeks of traveling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, almost a month in terms of the round trip. Oh, well, probably more than a month actually by the time you stopped on the ground up there as well. Of course, we were telling work that we were still working, so we were online a bit of the time. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> we are hard to get uh, access to your emails all the time in, in a remote Right, sitting like that. Was, race, that's for sure. But yeah, on the way back, we were trying to trying to be there a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and in terms of the safety preparation and the, the safety equipment you had to carry, does that, does that differ much from some of the previous, you know, ocean race or offshore passage type, type stuff you you've done? Not really. No, the, the the regulations were all pretty much similar. There wasn't um, life. But you didn't have life raft inspections or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that varies for different classes as well. Um, but yeah, it was slightly less, but certainly communications, everything being seaworthy, flares, radios, safety, signaling, all those things was all completely normal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and you had to be able to drag people back up, have some system to do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so they, they did a, Thorough job, and they also had presentations by the Coast Guard, um, and everybody carried, um, if they had nothing else, they were required to carry a tracker that pinpointed their position the entire time, and the Coast Guard and the military were aware of the race, so they could also track everyone at all times if they wanted to, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that those were required, and, and I guess every, you know everyone was given good briefings on how to stay out of trouble in terms of traffic uh, because a lot of the people may not have had a lot of experience with dealing with ships. Okay. Yeah. And okay. some of the passages, but yeah, it, it was responsibly done for sure. Because yeah. with some of those smaller vessels, it must be uh, challenging for them to fit all their supplies and safety gear and everything on board. When you start talking about stand up paddle boards and kayaks and stuff like that. And that's part of the creativity of the races. They're not required to go nonstop. They can stop and get, buy things, and they can go ah, to a restaurant. Oh, right. They can do gotcha. whatever they want. So they can stop for a yeah. meal here, there, and everywhere, and then yeah. carry on. And, and it's also um, one of the fun things about the race is no rules against people helping you. So if you break down, people can help you. Oh, you're, just not allowed, you're not allowed to have any pre-arranged uh, support. So you can't have food drops and things, but you can have um, – you can you – can, 
go wandering into town looking for a seven sixteenths bolt yeah. and you find one, you know, yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, it sounds, uh, I don't know if you ever remember, but do you remember the Cannonball Run from the 70s with Burt Reynolds? Um, where the, it was a race across America uh, and, and, and yeah, there was right. trucks and Ferraris and all sorts of, and it, it kind of didn't matter how you got there, but, you know, it was all the fun they had along the way. It's, it always sounds like the equivalent on the water. May have been some of their inspiration. I never asked them about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's it's really interesting. Um, really interesting. Uh, but, yeah, well, that, that does open it up to, I guess, a number of people when you look at, if you plan it well, um, the ability to sort of yeah. stop, stop like that. And so yeah, there was a couple that rode in a... Um, like a two-person Whitehall row craft mm -hmm. uh, the previous year, and then they did it in a two-person kayak this year, and mm -hmm. apparently with relative comfort. You know, they took their time, and they just stopped and ate and camped. and. So they would just sleep ashore each each night, and then or each, each time they yeah. sleep, and then jump in and carry on. Like, like day trippers, really, almost. Uh, Pretty much, but yeah. But, of course, it takes them almost three weeks instead of one, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. It's still... 750 nautical miles, which is still a long way to go. Um, and, and the real thing, like I guess, is that the race is everybody has their own race, really, because mm. there's no one quite like you. There's it's not one design. There's no um, measurement thing to do handicap or anything like that. So yeah. there's kind of you can't really take a lot of pride if you've got a you know super fast boat in beating a rowboat. <laughs> No, no, that's right. It's, that's, <laughs> but, it's everybody's own personal race against whatever. Yeah, whatever I think that's, that's part of it. That really appeals as well. well that's, as far as the race course goes, I don't think you could get a more varied and more interesting race course. I really don't. You know, just something going on all the time. Conditions constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Really, like big changes. Like instead of. You know, like if you're looking at an ocean race, you're looking at a pattern come through and the wind's going to swing and then it's going to change. But there you would have, you know, hard on the nose and then you turn a corner and then it's right behind you. And then 100 meters later, it's on the nose again and mm. dies for five hours and then it comes in. You know, it's just constant. So that stuff is, uh, it really gets your attention. Yeah, well, massively challenging, massively frustrating, but also you, you've always got to be ready to take advantage of whatever you get mm. served up. Yeah. Um, you don't know how long it's going to last sometimes, I guess, um, good or bad. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the way to do it, I think, and to, and to enjoy it, yeah. Okay, and how often does the race run? It's running every year wow. still. Um, it's going to run this, I think it starts in June 7th next year. Mm -hmm. um, and there's rumors they're going to change the rules in some maybe important way in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the guys that are running it really like the sort of um, wild, zany aspect of it. So they're not quite as excited to see seven farriers show up, I don't think. But, you know, <laughs> the sort of standard production trimaran type yeah. thing yeah. that has won it quite often. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, because that, yeah, that's, I guess, in terms of preserving its uniqueness and preserving the attractiveness and not turning into, you know, something that somebody wins more often than not in terms of a, a particular yacht design. That must be part of the challenge of... I think that's probably going to be behind the rule changes, but we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. And when it's no engines, does that mean if you've got a cruising boat with a built-in engine, you just can't do it? Or does that mean you just can't have fuel or a propeller on board? Or is there any... No, you're absolutely welcome to do it as long as you take the engine out. <laughs> so, so there... it's literally no engine at all. Yeah, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a Peterson 44, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, I don't know if you know, a big IOR boat, um, and he would have had a six-cylinder diesel, he took it out, wow. there was uh, a, a number of monohulls sort of in the 30-foot zone that had all taken their diesel engines out, Yeah, wow. so uh, yeah, people do it. I guess it's not too hard if you've got the right gear, and I guess it saves you the weight if you're planning on rowing your boat at some point. <laughs> yeah. And you can imagine that a Peterson 44 doesn't row very well. No, no, <laughs> no. But no. it's pretty well weather in a blow. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what my ideal boat would be, but I don't think it would be a Benito 45 either for some reason. Rowing no, 10, rowing was, 10 tons would be appealing. It was the race as well, and they didn't do that well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's one of the fun things is guessing what sort of uh, boat's going to suit. And the thing is that it changes, the conditions are so varied mm -hmm. that one year the boat that wins wouldn't win the next year. 
Oh, right. So it is. It does really mix it up, even from year yeah. to year, in terms of the cycles. Yeah, like if you get a good steady blow all the way through, the sailboats are going to totally kill it. And one year it's going to be so quiet that some human-powered thing is going to win it. You know, mm -hmm. but that hasn't happened yet. Um. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. That's, that's right. Because it's, it's getting that longer period of time with no breeze at all, particularly once you get out in the open ocean, I guess it's um, it's probably going to get harder. Yeah. This is pretty yeah. unlikely in that part of the world. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we do get long calms and big highs that just sit over the coast sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, do you have any plans from here for any other races or adventures or any other passage sort of passages you're wanting to do next? Well... We're idly playing with the idea of having another run in the 2020, depending if the rules suit us, because uh -huh. we really did enjoy it. And that would be involving, again, it would be a launch pad for, a, for this time, we would hopefully be a longer cruise up into Alaska uh -huh. and up the BC coast. Um, so that probably be one thing. And then ultimately, we're likely to sail the same boat back to Australia via the South Pacific, uh -huh. but probably not for another few years. Uh -huh. Well, that that'd yeah. be nice. That'd be a nice trip. Um, would you would you go down the down the west coast of the U.S. and then sort of across yeah, from there? Probably cross over from Mon, um, Mexico, Cabo, or mm -hmm. somewhere from there. That's I guess the milk run. Yeah, that would be a nice way to spend the uh, however long you wanted, really, um, depending on yeah. how long you to stretch that stretch that trip out over. Um, yeah, I think yeah. It's I mean we did it a long time ago in a little trimaran and it was wonderful. Um, I think it would be quite different now because of the amount of traffic mm -hmm. the places get, but it would be still beautiful, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And do you have an um, AIS or radar on your boat? We don't. Um, we don't have either of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And certainly radar would be an advantage on the coast north here because sometimes the fog is super thick. It's good in the fog and it's good at night with boats that are well lit up or, you know, hard to yeah. see. And that, that's the idea I, I have it, but I mean, I know a lot of people yeah. don't these days, but I still find it useful at certain times when, especially yeah. if you're shorthanded, it gives it's you a lot of peace. Certainly the time. AIS is, is a good thing. And we monitor other people's AIS, but we don't send an AIS signal all the okay. time. So Okay. Well, at least if you can see them, you're halfway, yeah. probably three quarters of the yeah. way to avoid well, them. Yeah. And I guess if you're constantly on watch, um, you've got a good chance of... Uh, seeing things but it is you do have sometimes closer calls than you think and there's more traffic out in the ocean than you think too sometimes mm. but yeah I think it's becoming completely the norm so we'll end up with AIS for sure mm -hmm. I don't think we'll go with radar just because of the type of boat we have mm -hmm. okay yeah. do you have monohull a big a biggish boat or uh, uh Benito 445 so 44 oh, and a half foot Benito um yeah. And See, there you, you, could, you could come in the race for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel just a long, a long time at the gym leading up to that to be able to row that baby for uh, more, more than more than half an hour. Um, if, if you have a look, the um, 2019 entries, there's an Australian boat already registered. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that hasn't <laughs> inspired me yet, but I think it'd be a cool, it'd be an amazing trip to do on the on the right sort of vessel. Um, yeah. And I've, I've done. Uh, we we did a race a couple of years ago. Um, this was the slowest uh, Sydney to Gold Coast race in history. And in fact, it was so slow that Wild Oats took two days instead of one and ran out of food. Um, oh boy! We didn't run out of food, but we had at least twenty four hours in the four days of, of no literally no breeze and going backwards in the north to south current. And, yeah, right. Uh, and I've seen I've seen how that that um, that causes immense frustration amongst your crew. Um, so ah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna extrapolate that into a race like that where you need to be able to keep your boat moving. Um, uh, for yeah. a reasonable percentage of the time, otherwise you just go stir crazy, waiting for the breeze. Um, so yeah, I think you need a different sort of boat, but um, or, or or you'd have to hire the right big burly, big burly uh, boys and girls who, who had who had rowers arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's great. Oh, that's excellent, Graham. Well, that's really fascinating, and it's, and it's a great story that you've you've shared, and I really appreciate you sharing it because it's just a. Uh, when I looked at the website itself. Um, only recently, and, and looked at what a unusual and uh, unique kind of race and adventure it is. I just thought it's just a really mm. cool, really cool uh, yeah. story to share. I would commend it highly to anyone who's interested. Um, I don't think we met anybody that didn't have a great time. Even one guy that didn't finish um, continued to, you know, 
report to the race people and still sends things to their website. So it's a kind of a community mm -hmm. building event as well, which is, which is a fun thing. And, and if somebody's considering doing this um, and, and you look at the, the combination of um, crew and vessel sort of that, that, are, that, have, that have the most success or the most fun in terms of getting from A to B, what would, what would your advice be if there was any advice you could give somebody else? Um, I guess from our experience and, and from listening to my crew, I would say that the best advice to give anyone is don't try and win and go in there to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, if you wanted to win, you just have to get a super fast boat mm. um, but, and one that's easily driven. But those boats aren't easy to come by. And, you know, if you've got one, you already know about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think for most people, it's really just a case of, Go in there with a idea to do the best you can in whatever way that means for you, and uh, and enjoy it, and look after yourselves and the rest of the people that you run into, and have a great time. That would be my advice. Well, I think it's I think it's great advice, particularly when you're in such a unique and scenic part of the world. Um, to 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 do it and not enjoy it would be a bit of a crime, really, um, and a lost opportunity uh, because you might only do it once in your life. Um, pro That's probably right. probably will only do it once in your life, so it's good to. Good to enjoy that. Actually, just on that point, um, that seems to be highly unlikely that you only do it once. Okay. Um, yeah, like there's people that have done it every single year and quite a few that have done it multiple times, even wow. in over four, with only four years. So wow. uh, there you go. So it's a bit like a Sydney Hobart <laughs> type situation where it becomes, a, becomes addictive. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, that's really, yeah. that is interesting. So, yeah, so the, the, the advice I'm glad is, that you were interested in that we could have a bit of a Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so the advice to anybody then is don't do it unless you're prepared to start coming back every year and doing it regularly and uh, take, a, take a month out of your life each year because it's, it's likely to become addictive. That's a good point. It could be the case, yeah. Yeah, there's certainly lots of conversation amongst the people that were in it last year. When are you going to do it again and we'll do it with you or change crews. People are buying new boats because they've changed their mind and there's consortiums forming. And, wow. you know, people, yeah, have been buying boats you know, like wrecks and fixing them up and doing all kinds of things because it's so different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, and it's good to hear it's such a healthy fleet. I mean, 30 something boats for a, for a race like that's a pretty healthy Pretty healthy, yeah. thing, really. Um, given the, the personal commitment and time you've got to put aside for it, in the That's preparation right. as well as in the completion, but then also getting your getting your boat back to where it started as well. And I guess the the people that enter carry a lot of that, but the people that are running it must need a certain amount just to make it, you know, sustainable. So I'm pleased that they're getting that. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, otherwise, yeah, without without sponsors and without funds, it's a pretty hard gig. Um, to give up yeah. time for if you can't cover all the costs, especially when there's safety costs involved as well. Um, so it's good that they've got a, a, a great formula. I um, mean, it's a, it's a real credit to them. Yeah, it sure is. Anyway, it's fun talking to you, David, and uh, I'll try and keep an eye out for some of your podcasts. Well, thanks, thanks, Graham, and thanks for putting the time aside. And if you've got any any photos or any video footage that you want to share as well, feel free to send me like a Dropbox link or something like that, and I'll... I'll link that to the episode when I publish it. People often love to see extra so background how do you extra actually, information. How do you actually go about this? Like, what will people? What will you actually put together, and how will people access it? Okay, so so what will happen is I'll um, do a little bit of editing, and then I will create a, an episode out of it, um, yeah. which I then publish um, on my website at oceansayingpodcast.com. Uh, it also gets fed automatically to um, iTunes and multiple other podcast apps and platforms out there that people can then look up the Ocean Sailing podcast and, and download and stream the show through their own mobile devices. And I'll, I'll send you some links for these bits and pieces yeah. when I publish it. Um, yeah. And then on the on the podcast page, I'll create a, an area for the episode, um, describe what it's about, an episode cover, and then link to any other resources. Um, I'll, re I'll link to the website for the, for the um, R2AK race website um, because yeah. people, people will listen to it next month, next year, the year after, like the, the, That's right, the podcast, yeah. people listen to the back library. So that carries on being, being relevant and useful. Um, and then mm. I'll create a, an episode page. If you have any other material like I can share, then I'll link to the episode page within the website where there's any other photos or links or PDFs or any, any background information you have. People, 
who really love to digest that kind of stuff. Um, if they're curious on, on finding out more about your story and, and seeing yeah. as your eyes, your eyes or just doing their research for, for doing the event themselves. So um, I could certainly send you some photos and I guess I'm just checking. You already probably have access to the um, R2AK yep. stuff. They have a number of videos that feature us as okay. well as others. Okay. So maybe I can just make a note of those and... Um, that would be great. Yeah. That would help steer yeah. me in the right direction um, with that as well. Yeah, so yeah, that's probably all and uh, I'll get the team on it because they'll have, they've got lots of photos. It'd probably bore you with how many you could get if you really want. But we'll oh, no, that would be great. A I mean, I, I talked to a, a guy called uh, Nick Maloney a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago who's done a lot of offshore stuff and he sent me a, a file with like 70 or 80 photos and they were absolutely fabulous. And um, I think mm. I published sort of 60 of those on the website and shared them to the Facebook group as well. And I've had lots of good feedback already from those. So, you know, I right. think, I think this, will, this will help us bring it to life. And personally, yeah. I find it fascinating and interesting. You know, I love the sailing I do. So even yeah. at a personal level, it's, um, well, it's a hobby for me and a passion for me. It's, uh, it's what I love doing as well. So I'm always happy to see yeah. the extra information. We actually did also make up a, a Facebook page for the race. Okay. So is that something you would access yep. or not? Yeah, now send me the link to that, and I can then link to that as well from okay. the podcast page too. So I'll link to I'll okay. link to anything, websites, what? Facebook pages, you know, photos. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll get the crew on it and see what we can come up with, and uh, and we'll get get some information to you in the next little while. Yeah, that'd be you good. And then I'll look to I'll get to get it published in the next um, couple of weeks or so, and that'll give you time to then put the information together. But I'll wait for you if you need a bit more time. Then okay. you know, it's, it's not yeah, okay. it's not time so I'll, critical. No. So I'd rather give you the time that you need, um, yeah. and then be able to put that out with all that all that in place. Because then on the podcast, I'll tell people to go to the website to look for that information. Go to the, mm. you know, your Facebook page to look for the information when I when I edit it prior to publishing. And just as a way, if we end up with a fairly large volume of stuff in terms of um, storage, yeah. is a shared Dropbox, Dropbox, an appropriate way to do that, or is it yeah. better to send by email? Dropbox is perfect. If you if you've got Dropbox and you put it into a folder, then you share the folder with me. That's yeah. what, that's that's much better because then I can just download from that folder and you don't have any email issues with it you yeah. know, crashing that, your, your that's, inbox. I think, especially if we're talking videos, there's probably a bit there. Yeah, yeah. And even once you get past five or six photos, you some email systems start to find it too hard or, or crash. So that yeah. Dropbox would be perfect. No, that sounds good. So we'll get the team on that and we'll get that to you as quickly as we can. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, Graham. I, I really appreciate the time and, and thanks for sharing such a, such a fascinating story of such an incredible event. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to just sort of seeing some of your extra background material on that, on that as well. Yeah, well, and uh, I hope that uh, I actually feel like it's hard to, to say enough about um, how great the crew was. So uh, I think I've said a couple of things about what I appreciated, but I hope I hope you can find a way to <laughs> to make sure that that, was, that appears. Uh, every, the... Everything we've discussed will appear. Um, so it's um, my, the podcast episodes are anywhere between forty five minutes and two hours long. So um, unless okay. you want me to take anything out, then everything everything gets published. Oh, no, and you don't want to bore people, but uh... <laughs> uh, well, you'd be surprised. People people love this stuff, and. Um, and, and they listen to it, you know, in, in the car or on the train or on the plane or the gym. So they're doing other things often while they're listening to the yeah, podcast. Right. So it yeah, doesn't, it doesn't intrude point. on your day, like watching a video or reading a, a, a you know, a, That's right. an article online. So um, yeah. I, I can only judge um, how people respond to this type of content. But also it auto plays in your car. If you if you listen to the first half hour, then next time you jump back in, it'll carry on automatically for you. Yeah, that's right. So it's not, like, it's not so like, like you're to fit into an exact <laughs> time frame like television or anything like that. So, you know, it's, it's really, really good. So, um, so I'll send you all those details when I publish it as well. So you've got all that information to see. Okay. Where it is we'll now, we'll be in touch, I guess, in yeah. the next little while. That would be perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you for the time. It's been fun. That's been my pleasure. Thanks, Graham. <laughs> Take care. Take Bye. care. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com. Dot AU. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. If you've got a great story idea or you know somebody who I can talk to, please uh, drop me an email with the details. If you'd like to join us on an upcoming ocean race regatta or adventure passage, check out the details at oceansailingpodcast.com. 
In 2019, we have a full calendar that starts with the Pitwater to Southport 360 mile ocean race in January, two Trans Tasman crossings uh, in March and April, uh, including a stop at Norfolk Island, the inaugural Brisbane to Hamilton Island 600 nautical mile yacht race in August, Hamilton Island Race Week, and later in the year, Southport to Middleton and Elizabeth Reefs, on to Lord Howe Island, then on to Sydney in preparation for the 75th edition of the Rolex Sydney Hobart. And we have one or two crew spots available uh, in most of those events. So again, check out the uh, calendar at oceansailingpodcast.com. I'm working on the 2020 calendar and started to release some of those events. 2020 is really exciting. Uh, starting with a 14-day, 800 nautical mile circumnavigation of Tasmania, followed by two 1,300 nautical mile trans-Tasman crossings, the Brisbane to Numea race, the 600 nautical mile New Caledonia Group Arm Race, uh, and then a 1,630 nautical mile passage from Fiji to Hamilton Island before doing Hamilton Island Race Week. So check out all of those events that are coming up at oceansailingpodcast.com and look out for updates to the calendar as I add some of the final touches to the 2020 a race and passage schedule in the next uh, few days. There's lots of photos, lots of videos you can check out to give you a bit of a taste of what it's about. But if you've always wanted to get offshore or go ocean sailing or join a, uh, a race team just for a, uh, a, a one-off ocean race, this is a unique opportunity to join a, an experienced professional team with a handful of spots we have available. I'll see you on the next episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. I picture cold dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun in a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around them cry and watching some getting ready to die